Mr. Wicker's Window, Chapter 8. Chris returned happily to his chair and curled up, and up in it as if he were at home. Even Mr. Wicker's expression seemed to have changed, and as a matter of fact it had, for the relief and portion of content that showed now in the boy's face was reflected in some measure in that of the man. Before seating himself, Mr. Wicker rang a silver bell ding, ding, on the tray by the pitcher. In a moment, Becky Boozer knocked on the door and stuck her gigantic hat through the opening. You rang, rang sir, she had inquired, the feathers and roses bobbing as cheerily as living things around the sweeping brim. I did, Becky. It occurred to me, said Mr. Wicker, looking sideways at Chris. It's some hot chocolate for Master Christopher, and coffee for, for, for me would not be a mist at this hour of the morning. And, he added, seeing the interesting spark in the boy's eyes, some of your delicious little cakes, perhaps. Most certainly, even Becky. Most certainly, sir. I have the chocolate heart, as it so happens, and some cakes new-baked. She bustled off and in no time returned with a tray of china cups matching flowered pots for coffee and for chocolate, a bowl of sugar, and a plate piled with cakes. In one corner, Becky pulled out a small table, which she placed between the two chairs. The tray was safely settled, the fire given a poke and a lo fresh log before Mistress Boozer removed herself in her starched dress and apron and her outrageous hat from her master's study. Now said Mr. Wicker, pouring out the steaming drinks. We shall refresh ourselves, and you shall listen, if you will. Chris took a sip of the hot chocolate and a bite of golden cake, deciding he had never tasted better. This point decided on with it in himself, and gave his attention to the man across from him. I told you, Mr. Wicker said, that I was a ship owner and a merchant. That is true, but these are troubled times. A revolution has had had the land in its grasp. Times are bad, and this vast land is now convulsed with the clear throes of democracy. Money is hard to come by, and much is needed, for General Washington's troops were farmers called away from their harvesting or sowing. The period of healing for them and for the land will be long and costly. He paused to sip his coffee and then put the cup down. Destruction is so fast, and to construct and build, Mr. Wicker said, staring at the fire. That is what is slow. He turned to Chris. Without financial help, without money for the beginning of this new land and this new government that is struggling to be born, this free place and this fine democratic experiment will fail. I know a way to save it, and you have been sent back into the past from our future my future and yours, and that of the land, to help us and make it real. You will not disappoint me, Christopher. Mr. Wicker turned burning eyes on Chris's face. You will help your country get its start. A wave of excitement such as he had never known surged over Chris, and he started to his feet, almost upsetting the table and making the cups rattle on their saucers. <coughs> oh, yes, sir, you bet. If I can, I'll help. Mr. Wicker's face expressed his satisfaction. He rose, too, and held out his hand. I knew you would, he said. It had to be, for it could be no other way. But there is always doubt. Your hand, my boy, for we had work to do together. The two hands, large and small, were firm. One in the other, and Chris felt a new power coming to him from the man whose hand he grasped. Listen closely. Mr. Wicker said, and Chris drew nearer. There is a wondrous thing, unique in the world, and which, for the benefit of this growing country, we must obtain. Its possession will mean we can pay for many things, a new city here, tools, building materials. This wonderful object is a jewel tree belonging to the Princess of China. Chris waited, listening. This jewel tree... Mr. Wicker went on, is a tree that grows, that puts out leaves and flowers and bears fruit. But here is the wonder of it. And he bent his piercing eyes on Chris's intent face. This growing tree is made of jewels, 
leaves and flowers and even seeded fruit. Leaves are emeralds, the flowers diamonds and sapphires, the fruits huge rubies sick with, sick with pearls. Imagine such treasure if you can. He spread his arms wide and Chris's eyes were shining with excitement. Imagine the possession of such a plant, Mr. Wickward went on. Break off a branch of it, another grows, and flowers and fruit, much like your orange trees, bear both their fruit and flowers at the same time. They sat down again, the better to continue in their conversation. The taking of such a prize would be hard enough, Mr. Wicker continued, for it is well guarded, but there is a greater hazard. He rose from his chair to walk about, and there was nervousness and eagerness at what lay ahead. Then he went on. There is a man here, posing as a merchant, Claggett Chu. You will see him in the town when you walk there, which you shall do presently. But he has some magic powers and knows me well. Too well. Is he after the jewel tree, too? Chris wanted to know. He is. He heard of it by power of magic, certainly. For it is a secret well so well guarded that those who carry knowledge of it, all but myself up to this time, all others have died before they could make use of it. You can well imagine, Mr. Wicker enlarged, turning his gaze on Chris, that a treasure that replenishes itself is beyond price. The Chinese emperor knows it well. So did the guards about his palace, and so does Claggett Chu. Mr. Wicker strode about, striking a closed fist of one hand under the palm of another. And Chris scrambled out of his chair to stand watching the pacing figure. And it came to Chris as he followed, with his eyes, uh, this black swinging cloak, the silver buckled black knee breeches, a neat white sock and black brocaded waistcoat of the magician. It came to him that he had a great confidence and affection for this man. Even knowing him as little as he did, having to take so much on trust, still in Chris's mind there was no smallest grain of doubt, sufficient or distrust. He knew without having to think it that Mr. Wicker was a great man, great in knowledge and in heart, reliable and kind and wise. In that moment, put, put his whole faith in a man he had not known yet for, uh, uh, for a day. There is one way, Mr. Wicker said, wheeling about and standing still, and that is where I need your help. He strode back across the room towards Chris. This villain, Claggett Chu, for that is what he is, no better. This villain knows me and he knows my power. If my power were in a boy, a lad he would never suspect. Then... Mr. Wicker put both hands on Chris's shoulders and looked searchingly at him. Then only would we have an opportunity to seize the jewel tree. Can you learn what I know? demanded Mr. Wicker. Can you learn my magic? M magic? Miss Stammer. Those tricks? The fly? And others? Yes, said Mr. Wicker quietly. Many more. Well, Chris answered after a moment's thought. I got here, didn't I? I've gone back all these years, so I guess I could. He looked up with a grin. At least I can try, he said. Mr. Wicker gave Chris's shoulder a little shake of pride and acceptance. Good lad, he said. I know that you can learn. For you it will not be hard. There's just one thing. Chris said with puzzlement in his voice. You say, sir, see is the tree. That means just stealing it? Must we do that? Mr. Wicker looked at Chris, and his face was serene and smooth with the great satisfaction of his feelings. You are the lad for me, he cried, and Chris found himself coloring with pleasure at the tone in Mr. Wicker's voice. I knew it from the first. It would be stealing, boy. But for one thing, when, and heaven willing, if you reach the tree, you will break a branch from it and stick it in the ground. It will root itself and grow and thrive, and the princess will still have delicate jewel flowers for her hair. And now, he said, I smell the broiling chicken. Off you go and eat your lunch. 
Later we shall talk again. Chris went out smiling. Mr. Wicker's Window by Carly Dawson, Chapter 8, End.